Why don't we get uh, Why don't we get going? I think we're it's two thirty. Supposed to start at two thirty-five. I think we're we can get going a couple minutes early. Um, thanks for uh, everybody attending. Appreciate it. Um, we had a great panel discussion today uh, planned. Um, the group that we have here have been working on several different open source uh, firmware projects, uh, security, uh, system firmware, um, BMC, and, um, and we, we'd uh, very lucky to be able to pull everybody together for this panel discussion. Um, so let me start off by um, talking about firmware. Um, it's a little different than um, software in that uh, you have to have uh, a, a significant knowledge of the hardware. You need to know the I.O. maps. You need to know how, you, you have to have a schematic, first off, to start with. You have to have an I.O. map. You have to know the devices that are connecting, that you're going to connect to and talk to. You have to understand the protocols of the buses that you're running, like an I2C bus or PCI bus. Um, and so it's, it takes an interesting um, skill set to, to be able to put together the, the software to, to control that hardware. And as an open source community, uh, we've realized that uh, as part of this community that it's really important that we, um, that we focus on all of the embedded software uh, that controls the hardware. And again, really trying to enable a, a complete solution. Um, and so one of the earliest projects um, was focused on the BMC, and if I go back about three years, I'll give you a brief history. Um, there was a, a project within Facebook that was uh, kicked off, and I think they actually hired a couple of uh, summer interns that were tasked with um, basically writing um, BMC firmware to control a switch. And uh, at the end of that project, they proved that it could be done and uh, they uh, open sourced the code, and I think that became the original uh, repo uh, for the OpenBMC. Um, shortly, uh, or, or concurrent with that project, there was another project underway, uh, a, a collaboration project between uh, Rackspace and IBM on an open power uh, platform, and uh, that platform later on uh, was called BarrelEye and was contributed and is available in open source um, on the OCP website. And, uh, and that project really took that original um, hack from Facebook and, and re-architected the code and, uh, and, and built a, a repository that, uh, that was uh, reproducible and, 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 and structured. And um, uh, Rackspace, being a consumer, uh, relied on the, the, the work and support of the IBM team. And uh, Brad Bishop on the panel here is, uh, you know, was part of that original, original team. Thanks, Brad. Um, and so that's really where I think that that uh, you know you guys figured out how to kind of break that, crack that that egg, and, and start the process, and that happened um, three years ago, two and a half, three years ago. Um, since then, uh, the OpenBMC project has has continued to evolve under the the guidance of IBM, and um, and recently was was uh, transferred under the ownership of uh, or the the uh, care and feeding of the Linux Foundation. Uh, before that, there was a group of, of uh, uh, about a half a dozen companies that were uh, engaged with, with that, and Facebook, uh, Intel, Microsoft, Google. Um, am I missing? I'm sure I'm missing somebody. Um, and, and, and other companies that uh, uh, I think Mellanox was involved in it and, and a couple others. Uh, they were involved in that project and, and have actually built a pretty good um, repository um, that's, that, that's actively contributing today, and I think we have probably... 75 actual, you know, contributors to code today about that. Um, so again, it's uh, you know live and well, and and we're looking forward to actually seeing um, some products released here, uh, built uh, with images that are coming off of that source tree. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit of a little bit of background. Um, let's. I'm going to start off and, and have the panelists um, introduce themselves. I'll start here at this end, and we have microphones. We just pass on down. So. Um, starting with uh, Mohan Kumar, you can tell us, a, you know, in one, one or two sentences, uh, introduce yourself and, and uh, a little bit about your involvement in, not particularly BMC, but just open source embedded firmware. Yeah, hi. My name is Mohan Kumar. I'm a fellow at Intel Corporation. I've been uh, at Intel for 25 years. 
And uh, I worked on many, uh, where I work on is basically where the platform meets uh, the OS, so the interfaces that uh, fill into which essentially happens to be firmware. And I worked on uh, ACPI, PCI, uh, the BMC from IPMI, now Redfish, so various uh, standards. And I also represent Intel in the OSF, OS, OSF, OSF, Open System Firmware, and on the security work groups at OCP. Uh, hi again. Uh, my name is Badruddin Kasib. Uh, I'm senior director at uh, Microsoft. Uh, what I do day to day is I own the firmware development uh, for the project Olympus and all the uh, hardware projects within uh, within uh, Azure hardware. Oh, hi. I'm Ron. I'm, I'm a kernel guy who does firmware on the side. Um, I realized that I wrote my first firmware 40 years ago for what I thought was the last time for an 8-bit machine, and then found myself starting a Linux BIOS project in 1999, and that now is the firmware for every Chromebook you see. It's called Core Boot. And then we've recently started the Linux Boot effort, which is now part of the Linux Foundation. Oh. Hi, Brad Bishop. Um, I've been on the IBM's BMC software team for about 18 years, right out of school. Um, I've been there ever since. I'm here today. Um, two, three years back, I caught wind of a, <clears throat> a plan to develop a free and open source BMC stack with our friends at Rackspace. Bill talked about the Barrel Eye project. I was involved with that. And fast forward to today, I find myself on the, the TSC of the Open BMC project. Thanks, Brad. Um, hi, I'm Nancy. I've um, been doing software for almost 20 years. I I've been with Google Platforms for about 10 years. Uh, a few years ago, I took over our, our internal BMC project, uh, running on uh, Google and Rackspace's uh, OCP server Zaeus, which is based on BarrelEye. Mm -hmm. um, and we had the goal of integrating uh, OpenBMC into Google's infrastructure. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tian Fan. I'm a software engineer at Facebook where I spend uh, most of my time on developing and deploying FBOSS, which is a software stack running on Facebook Switch. Also, OpenBMC, which powers uh, Facebook compute, storage, and the network hardware in DC. So, um, Tian, I'll just hold on to the mic right there, and let's talk a little bit about OpenBMC and, and um, you know, how OpenBMC got started and where is, where is it at within Facebook now? That's great. Uh, you give some history uh, on that front. So that's about four years ago, back in 2014, and we were developing our first Facebook switch wedge. And we had a philosophy uh, that uh, a switch is also a server, so we put a BMC chip into it. Then in one of the Facebook hackathon event, uh, some of the engineers we got uh, BMC devil board, spend the night, play with it. And after a night of hacking, we're able to generate an image, blow some fans, blink some LEDs. And then after that, our hardware engineer say, oh, in order for you guys to keep going, can you, how long do you need to provide uh, out-band interface function? So we, in about a week, uh, we're able to demonstrate our band interface together with the full IPv6 support as a bonus. So back then, I didn't tell our hardware engineer that the v6 support comes from this kernel. It's a free bonus. But they are very excited, and that's how Facebook OpenBMC project started. Thank you. Let's pass the mic on to Nancy. Maybe she can give us some insight on how it's the same or maybe uh, potentially different uh, inside of Google. Um, well, uh, you know, Google uh, has been doing its own thing for a long time, um, and it designs its own servers um, and uh, its own management uh, solution. <clears throat> and uh, so we've built up a lot of software and infrastructure um, to monitor and manage um, Google's fleet. Um, but then we had Zaius come along, and Zaius is OCP, so it's uh, running OpenBMC. 
Um, and it was, uh, you know, having a full Linux environment and being able to use standard Linux tools and being able to uh, monitor and, and manage and debug the, the server, um, you know, uh, independent of the host, it was, it was really great. Um, and uh, using the Zayas design as is you know, running OpenBMC um, was also very appealing. Um, it would give us uh, an opportunity to investigate using commercial uh, solutions, um, which usually come with a BMC and it would run OpenBMC. Um, so we decided that the best path forward would be to, uh, to integrate OpenBMC into Google's infrastructure and to work with the OpenBMC community um, to develop a solution that met Google's needs. Great. Um, why don't you hand the mic over to Brad and, and I'm going to talking about OpenBMC, so you were there at the beginning, and uh, you've had a chance to see the, it evolve for three years. Maybe you can share some insight. Yeah, so <laughs> back in the beginning, um, it, would, it was kind of like being a kid in a candy store. Um, the, the team working on, you, you talked about um, the Barrel Eye project. The, the team that was working on that, their, their prior experience was based on I'll call it a um, mature, uh, stable Linux stack. So old kernels, old tool chains, old tech all around. Then all of a sudden, there, there weren't any rules. Um, the direction was just, we're, we're going to start over, um, use as much open source technology as you can. And you know, as a developer, that was, um, that, that was really rewarding. Uh, it still is to go off and identify those things and uh, figure out how to incorporate them in what we do. It, it has to be pretty exciting to see the number of contributors that you have working on it today. It, it is, and I, the, I'm hoping the news uh, from Monday is going <laughs> to make that number, I don't know, factor of 10. Thanks. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit to, uh, to system firmware, also known as BIOS. Um, let's talk about uh, a little bit about what system firmware is. Um, really, when you first turn on your system, it does a couple of things. It has to initialize the chipset. Sometimes it does some initialization of the processor. Um, it loads some drivers, uh, and then it loads an OS. Um, in uh, it reflected on Ron's experience back in you know 1999, it took about a million instructions to to do that, and today it takes about a billion instructions to do that. So it's, you know, it's a tremendous amount of, of differences and, and um, much more sophisticated today. Um, I'm going to ask Mohan uh, here if he would share you know, your experience, particularly working um, and what's different now. Now, uh, Mohan was involved with uh, the Tiano core, and, um, and part of that is, is open sourced. And how is that project? It started what 20 years ago. How is that different than the work that we're doing today? I mean, the, the systems were uh, simpler in the, at that time. I mean, if you think of those systems, as simple. And you know, with the emergence of you know uh, two socket and four socket and even eight socket and bigger platforms, the the complexity of the firmware that's needed to initialize. And then you know, if you go back to 20 years, everything was uh, disaggregated at that time. Right? There was a CPU. There was memory was separate. I/O was separate. And now they're all integrated, which makes the firmware's job of initializing all of those things uh, that much more challenging because you have to come out of reset and essentially go through the flow, set up memory, you know, initialize the I/O devices before anything useful can be done on a on a platform. And uh, I think as the uh, OCP and open momentum has caught on, so some of the things we started off, you know, where which was uh, mostly. Uh, a, con a solution that was focused on its given platform is turning it more into an mm -hmm. open approach. And uh, it, later in, at 420, I'm going to talk uh, in, in the next room, basically telling you guys more about how we are opening up uh, the uh, Tiano or UEFI firmware to do the kind of things that Ron and the folks here in this, room, in this uh, panel would like to do. Great. Um, which actually is a, a good segue to the next question. I want to direct this to Ron. Um, if you were sat in the earlier session, um, there was a, a diagram that we used uh, that kind of talks about the different options through that boot flow, um, UEFI being one boot option and the others to leverage um, Linux boot, a recent project uh, initiated in the Linux Foundation. 
Um, Ron's been involved in that, and, and um, maybe you can talk a little bit about you know, what's going on with Linux boot and, and how you see that evolving in, in um, the open um, system firmware stack. Yeah, so the Linux boot is, is sort of the, the third in this series of uh, open source uh, BIOSes we, or firmware we've been developing, and it's designed to function in a world where proprietary information about chips that start up, and that's generally the x86 side of the house, just won't be available. So we've architected it to put Linux in as, your, as the top level of your firmware, as the thing you do once DRAM is turned on. And we can function if you're in an Intel or AMD world where that early startup is going to remain proprietary, or if you're in a RISC-V or power world where that early startup you own from first instruction on. And that's maybe the single most important difference from uh, Linux BIOS. Um, but that, that's the goal of, of Linux boot, to get Linux into the game as early as you can possibly get it. Yeah, thanks. Um, three years ago, we were having these conversations about com creating a completely open platform uh, with Aaron Sullivan from Rackspace. Uh, two years ago, we had actually had a very similar conversation I did with the, the Microsoft hardware team and said, how do we achieve that? And, uh, and, and so we really started on that journey two years ago. And, and today, Microsoft is involved in uh, many of the, these open source projects and projects within OCP. Um, Badruddin, how do you see, uh, what, what does this do, the fact that we have an open system firmware project, uh, that we're, we're tackling the, the, you know, the thing we used to call BIOS, right? And what does this do for, for, for you and your product line in, in Olympus? It actually, it's a game changer yeah. for, for Microsoft. Um, and for the ecosystem as well. So we have a very good friendly relationship with the BIOS vendors and so on. I think the issue or the friction in the, in the ecosystem today is that we cannot transfer innovation. We cannot transfer um, things easily across to other partners. So for example, I mentioned in my previous presentation, we gave all the schematic, all the Gerber, all the CAD models, but we cannot keep, we cannot give away the, the firmware, right? Whether it's BMC or UFI. Um, so that's kind of inhibitor in the whole open, open hardware ecosystem. Uh, but also it actually has some implication on Microsoft itself, because what we want, we want to take advantage of what's out there in the ecosystem. I don't want to have to recreate the wheel, right? If somebody goes and invents something or write a code for some feature, I don't have to go and write it myself. I can just go grab it, put it on in, 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 and bring it in-house, right? So it works both ways. So closed firmware, closed UFI, closed BMC, it's really an inhibitor to innovation. It just, it just makes the flow of creativity or innovation across partners much harder. You have to have legal agreements, you have to sign agreements, you have, and the money is not, I mean, for most partners, which I know, and it's not really the major inhibitor, it's not the financial aspect, it's the legal aspect, that you cannot share IP freely, right? And, and that's kind of a problem. Thank you, so we talked about um, BMC, we've talked about BIOS, let's talk about just generally, um, you know, open source system firmware, and, um, uh, maybe Ron can share some insight on how big that population is today of firmware developers and relative to, you know, software developers and, and, and you know, what, is it, what does that mean for us? So I think the, the rough uh, figure everybody uses for Linux is 10,000 contributors. We did a quick survey of core boot contributors going back from 1999 to present and it's a total of 622 people. Uh, so, you know, roughly 15 times fewer people. Um, it's a bit trickier business to get into, and I, I realized when I was explaining it to someone who was having a problem, um, people think hardware works correctly. And so the first thing you have to remove from their thinking is that the hardware is working correctly, because the whole point of firmware is to take all this broken hardware and make it act like it actually works like the book says it does. Because it, it, right? Yeah, right, it, it never works the way the books say it does. So that, that's the two biggest issues. And, that's why we have trouble getting more people. Sorry, my phone is ringing. <laughs> <laughs> so Brad, I'll, I'll um, ask you a similar question. You know, what happens if the project takes off? Um, how, how is it different? I mean, we have the potential for this to really you know, take off and, 
as Ron mentioned, we have a you know a much bigger you know community of developers. What does that what does that mean to your project? I, <clears throat> so you can break down how we invest in firmware into maybe you could categorize it as uh, software that adds value for our users, and then the other half, which is software that that doesn't add value. So tool tool chains, frameworks, et cetera, Th things you need to enable the former. Um, and we all, we all invest in that uh, redundantly. And that's something communities are really good at, that's a problem they're good at solving. And so I, um, you know, I'm hoping if the project takes off that that gets addressed and frees up you know, we can pass that saved costs on to, to someone or, or our, all, all of our developers can, can truly innovate and, and do things that add value. Yeah. Nancy, if we could double or triple the number of developers on these projects, uh, you know, what does that mean? Do, we, do you think we're going to affect the outcome, affect the world? What's, what's um, it look I like? Think, I think um, OpenBMC has a lot of potential and a lot of really uh, interesting things that we could do with it. Um, yeah, and you know, especially if we have more developers in this space, um, what I'd really like to see is um, if we separate out the um, the server management from the, um, the from the workload of the host. So, um, <clears throat> so uh, you know, make them completely independent systems. Um, the BMC could you know manage resources, allocate them depending on workload. It could even disable a host if it uh, if it, it appears to be hostile. Um, uh, you know, and this would impact hardware designs. Um, it, the BMC would need to be able to manage all aspects of uh, of a machine. Um, and I think in a, in a cloud environment, um, it would make sense to build a larger uh, uh, management infrastructure around around the machine management um, in order to coordinate, you know, management of, of uh, uh, the management functions and the workload functions. Yeah, yeah. And um, kind of similar question to Tian, you know, Facebook has experienced you know tremendous growth and hired a lot of people. And you know, what does this do when you open source a project? Does that do you kind of see the landscape changing and you know, within your development team? So, one special thing in Facebook is uh, when we develop the software, we also deploy it, we also support it. One major benefit or thing we observed after we introduced or deployed OpenBMC in our production is it suddenly opened the system. Right? Uh, people can SSH into the system using the familiar tool to debug issues. And Ron mentioned that there's a major gap between firmware engineer and regular en software engineer. However, with the open system, a lot of software engineer able to make a contribution to this system now, OpenBMC. And people can write software, especially with a lot of new people joining, they can contribute to this area. So we see a lot of contribution not from the OpenBMC team itself, it's from the, the great software engineer community now. And that introduced all the new dynamic, the tuning, the language, everything. So that, it's open, that's what we want for this. Great, thank you. I think we have time for one, maybe two questions. Is there anyone that uh, um, would like to pose a question to this group? It's a great opportunity um, to have uh, these six individuals up here today. Feel free to jump up to the microphone. Um, uh, we do have a couple of follow-on sessions. Uh, Mohan, why don't you mention again what the, your follow-on session is? Yeah, so the, 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 the key topics that were hit in the keynotes were open system, uh, system firmware and uh, security, and I'm going to talk about what Intel is doing specifically in those things at 420 in the room next door. It's, the title is OCP, OCP Initiatives and Intel Implementation. Great, thank you. We also have a, a track dedicated to uh, embedded software tomorrow. It starts off in the morning from 9 to noon, uh, focused on uh, the OpenBMC. Uh, Brad will, will, again, kind of kick the, the group off with a, a deep dive on, on 
what's going on um, with OpenBMC and the repo today and the, the work with the foundation, the Linux Foundation. Um, and then we actually have uh, speakers from all of the companies that are, in, that are involved in it, and they're going to talk about specifically what they're doing um, on the project and what they're contributing. So a great session tomorrow. It's an engineering workshop. You'll look it up on the agenda, um, 9 to noon. And then in the afternoon from 1 to 3, we have another track focused on new projects, and, and it starts off with a uh, uh, discussion on uh, uh, security. Uh, and, uh, and again, Project Cerebus in more detail, and also open system firmware, that we, a project we kicked off a few weeks ago. And we're going to, again, kind of go into some of the options that, that are being explored by that, tr that team. And we'll get to hear uh, from Ron Minich of Google and hear about the options and, uh, and being able to use Core Boot as, a, as an alternative uh, for some of the, the system code. So I encourage you to uh, participate in, in either one of those. So I think we're right at the, the time limit. Um, any last questions that anyone has? Any last words or parting thoughts? Anyone? OK. Uh, thanks, Bill. And thanks, Facebook, for hosting. And real quick, Brad, what's your GitHub URL for OpenBMC? GitHub.com slash OpenBMC. OK, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much.